Hey, Garrett. Hi. What the hell are we doing? I uh, thought we were recording. Well, we are. Okay. Well, great and fantastic. We are recording Raiders of the Lost Ark for a new podcast. A new podcast, you say? I did. <laughs> well, it couldn't have been anybody else. <laughs> I don't even remember what it's called. Oh, yeah. Digital Drive-In Podcast. That's what I mean, it it's is. right in front of you. Is it? Should be. Oh, kind of. I didn't have this part open. Oh. Yes. You know, it's uh, like the old drive-ins when you go and see a really cool movie that everyone was talking about. Mm-hmm. But now it's all digital. So oh. we have to use it over the interwebs and talk about it. Wow. Imagine that. I'm trying to. Me too, and it's not coming out. No, it's almost, it's like we ate too much cheese. (laughs) This is terrible. I don't know, I'm making this up as I go. (laughs) I hate snakes, Jock, I hate them. (laughs) Uh. Indy, why does the floor move? <laughs> and welcome, everybody, I suppose, to the very first, very inaugural number one issue episode of the Digital Driving. Yes. My name is Alex Garrett. You're here, too. I am here t- as well. We're talking about a little bit, a little known film. Unknown indie gem, I would say. <laughs> indie gem. <laughs> ah, that, that was the joke. Thanks for explaining it for uh, certain people out there. People, yeah. Um, what are we talking about then? Since you ruined my joke. Oh, get out of my off five. Uh, uh, we're talking about Raiders of the Lost Ark, the greatest Lost Ark movie ever. Wow, well, one would say it's probably the greatest Raiders movie ever. Probably. It might, in fact, be the greatest movie titled Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm-hmm. But don't mm-hmm. quote me on that because I haven't seen all of them. Uh, I will now quote you. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, no. So, tell me, Garrett, what's your experience with Raiders of the Lost Ark? Uh, my, My first experience is almost too far back for me to remember. I am not old enough to have actually... Because you're an old fuck. Yes. I'm not old enough to have actually seen it at the cinema, but I do remember heavily renting it as a kid and and wearing out the VHS tape. (laughs) So that most of my earlier things for Raiders of the Lost Ark, I didn't actually see it in the theater until much later. I don't know about you, if you experienced it like on. I watched it 400 times in the theaters. (laughs) Come on. The joke being here that I'm young. Yes. But uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark for me is always one of those movies that I just remember seeing. Mm -hmm. Except the fact that I can I can vividly remember my first time watching it, which was sitting down literally just on the floor, three feet away from the TV with the DVD and and like totally enthralled by it. And it just became a movie like you did, I guess, where I watched it over and over and over again Mm -hmm. until the end of time. Would you consider it a cultural zeitgeist? Well, considering I don't know what that word means, probably. (laughs) Jeez. (laughs) So are you going to explain what that word means? Or? <laughs> no, no, we're just going to move on. Okay. Okay. Just, uh, yeah. okay, that's it. Yeah, so I don't know. It's always just one of those movies that uh, I just just seen, you know? Mm-hmm. And from there, I think it was one of the few that start, sort of sparked my love for film. Because it was one of those movies I very quickly acknowledged it as being borderline perfect, if not perfect, even at that young age. And on top of that, I loved it. Like, I loved watching it, and it was entertaining and all of that. And I could watch it endlessly, and I could still watch it endlessly. So, to say this movie has a pretty big impact on me, I suppose a little bit of an understatement, I guess. Yeah. I don't know about you, but... Let me let me throw you off. Let me sidetrack you here mm-hmm. for just a second. Indiana Jones versus Han Solo. Who is cool? Oh, it's Indiana Jones, 100%. Okay. Yeah, I feel the same way. I I I thought of Harrison Ford more as yeah. Indiana Jones than I ever did as now, Han Solo. Don't get me wrong; both are great. 
Oh, sure. But when I think of Harrison Ford, I instantly go to Raiders, right. really. But all of them. And I think yeah. it's because of just how phenomenal this movie especially is. And it's so head and shoulders on him. He's in every single scene, mm-hmm. basically. There's maybe one or two where he right. isn't. But while I found, you know, Han Solo is that rugged supporting character there to, to support Luke and stuff. He when he really gets to shine with something like Raiders and have a deeper sort of uh, almost more nuanced, I guess you could say. He, yeah. it's, it's it's phenomenal. So, yeah, I'm I, Indiana Jones all the way. <laughs> Well, I guess we'll dive right into it then, Garrett. We'll just talk about a general consensus of this movie. I think it's utter shit. What about you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's uh, it was completely forgotten about. Yeah. Nobody ever uh, talked about it again. No cultural and, uh, impact. Influence. None. An abomination. I mean, you uh, if you go into a clothing store and see a hat or you see a whip, regardless of what kind it is, you almost always, like, so if you if you were to show it to somebody, people would say, ah, Indiana Jones. So any hat, regardless of what it is? Oh, not, I meant any whip. You said hat. Oh, I said hat. So if and you then, walked into anyway, a store and saw a top semantics. hat. Semantics. Yes, then you, would, you wouldn't think of Mr. Peanut. Or if you walked into a <laughs> store and saw just like a back, a baseball cap. <laughs> yes. Indiana Jones. <laughs> Yes. Fantastic. I know what you're going for, though. I'm glad I'm glad we're on oh, the yeah. same page. <laughs> when I see bowler hats, I immediately go Indiana Jones. Hmm? Or bonnets. He was very famous for wearing his, his yep. bonnets. Yeah, but see, bonnet in certain parts of the world means car hood. Yeah, he wore those, too. <laughs> <laughs> so when he was incognito... He just disguised himself as a car <laughs> That's how I could get around so well. Immediately, we're sort of introduced to this character and probably one of the best ways in cinema to introduce yourself to the protagonist. Yeah, I mean, it's I mean, at first you you don't even see his face. You see like his back, you see his profile, you see him in shadow with with and you would think with a shadow of just a person that it wouldn't necessarily be iconic, but he just has that iconic stance and the hat, and the jacket and the whip on the side and just his charisma from his movements and what's going on. You can read so much into what kind of character mm-hmm. he is. But then of course, when he hears the gun cock and he has to rear back with the whip and whip it out of the guy's hand. And then there's the full reveal mm-hmm. of his face stepping out of the shadows such a great and iconic way to introduce a character. It's uh, iconic is not even like it's an understatement of this introduction, I think. And it just goes to show how much uh, Spielberg understood how to visually show those things to the audience so that they were like right and along and in line with Mm -hmm. what was going on. What about the rest of the cave sequence? And what about the supporting characters that are with him? Well, I mean, it's it's nice because you have the one guy that obviously is like the mm-hmm. traitor. And then you have the one guy that you're not real sure, but he is kind of like with Indy. And so you're not, you know, it's like, is is he just going to be expendable or is he there to actually help him out? Because um, he, he doesn't get across the ravine very well and Indy kind of has to yeah. help him and is like telling him, like, stay out of the light. But it's like having that foil there is good to explain like some of the mechanics of when the, they go into this cave, mm-hmm. how there are the traps and the different things they have to go through. So it's like t- telling the character, but also exactly, telling the audience. Yeah. When he says something like, stay out of the light. Now the audience right. is aware of the light, but also Cepito is as well. And then like having having to explain if you step on the stone that it's going to shoot out a poison dart and he has to like demonstrate it to the guy. And then he's like, well, I'm just going to stay here. <laughs> You know, as you wish, senor. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, the to- toss me the uh, throw me the idol, the I throw statue. The Pleb. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like you have a little bit of character drama there, a little bit of like having to make a decision at the last mm-hmm. second that 
Spielberg does a great job with ratcheting up the tension. At first, it's like really slow going, and then it all comes back in the same area, but really fast. Yeah. So it's like from a filmmaking perspective, you're getting double use out of the same set, but it doesn't feel like you're going over the same ground again. Yeah. Walking up to the idol is very slow and and methodical while ap- getting it, getting the idol. And then as the temple sort of falls apart, you know, he has to run through it all very hastily and tripping some of the traps and all that. Right. Yeah, you're right. It's a great way to both use two sets, but also show sort of the dangers of that tomb. Yeah. And, and then and it's not like build up, build up, build up and then nothing. It's like it's building up for an actual sequence that, you know, it helps you get into the mood of an action film and it gets that satisfying ending of, of a set piece. But then it also is, again, character building. So it's like it it's useful in multiple arenas. And it's got the well. slowest closing door in the entire world when he. <laughs> <laughs> well, you Rat- can see in one tension. shot, it looks like the door is pretty much closed. And then in the next shot, it's like three quarters open mm-hmm. again. Yeah, I, don't know, I just find it hilarious every time. Yeah, and that's that's some of that serialized part where it, it comes from the, those old Republic serials. And of course the iconic boulder running, which is fantastic. Yes. Absolutely fantastic. And the story behind that too with the uh styrofoam boulder still weighing a ton or whatever is Right. Like they did it, but that that's real, him running away from it. So it's it's really cool to see that. And it's uh, especially at this point, you really notice it. And then as you go through and watch it multiple times, the sound mm-hmm. design in Absolutely. this movie is so fantastic. Well, it's uh, it's Ben Burt, right? The guy that did the Star Wars movies. Wally, yeah, he voiced Wally and did and all Wally. the sounds for it as well. He's probably one of the better, or if not the best, sound design engineer out there. I would say He's so many iconic sounds come from him. It's it's. Yeah, it's right. on full display here, especially in this sequence. It's, it's so much fun. And it's cool, too, watching the Blu-ray. Um, I, I recognized a lot of the same colorization techniques as was in, like, The African Queen. And it's like it actually looks like almost a period movie right when it first starts off with that kind of the Technicolor brown yeah. kind of washed-in look. And then, it, it, you know, it, it slowly looks... I mean, it, it, it never looks bad or anything, but it's just like the fact that it's it's very stylized and you kind of like slowly get ingrained into the world and then it kind of shows it yeah. more as a, like modern technique at that time period. Well, it being set during World War II does make it a period piece even when it came out. But it's even and then now especially. Right. But I really do think this is one of those movies that is just timeless and you watch it. And I think it's got that filmmaking angle to it. Yeah. Like you were saying in the coloring and in some of the shots and all that and how it's that serialized kind of pulpy adventure fun that makes it totally timeless and the way how it's done so incredibly well. Did you have a particular scene that you would like to talk about? How about the, um, the scene where we get introduced to Marion at the bar? Yes, exactly. She's but, out drinking. Everybody. Uh, it took me a couple of times to notice this. That, that entire sequence is one shot where it zooms in on the two of them mm-hmm. drinking and it pans over to Marion, back down to the drinks, over to the fat guy, I don't even know his name, back down to the drinks and back and forth and so on and so on. And I just find that scene to be so... <laughs> it's so masterfully directed in in and setting up her character as well. Sort of a uh, no-holds-barred kind of takes no gruff from anybody can out drink anyone tougher than she looks kind of character you know she plays around with the guy a little bit when she takes mm-hmm. the drink and starts to pass out everybody's oh, oh oh and then of course she's uh whips back in shape immediately and she's playing with them the whole time because when he passes out she's back to almost 100 percent sobriety right it's a, it's a, i think that's right. honestly on par of an introduction with indy's introduction but that's just me no, it's 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 extremely well done. Yeah, it's 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 um. I mean, with the John Williams score too, oh, it's, it's almost melodic in the way it's shot. And we could even get into the John Williams score, and how. <laughs> I mean, it's just we're just going to be gushing on this movie the entire podcast, but it is the whole point. This is just about That's fantastic the movies. Yeah. <laughs> the John Williams soundtrack is obviously 
the main theme is so iconic that da, 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 da. but even some of the more smaller minute sort of themes i found myself watching this movie uh humming along to because i had seen it so many times or i had played lego indiana jones the video game i love that video game but having it so in the music so ingrained in my yeah. head it's just a wonderful score that doesn't leave me and every piece of music is it fits so well in the scene that it's in and i mean that's john williams but i think it's on full display in this one mm-hmm well, so he, he especially he gives like hints of the overture, but he never it, it like it takes a little bit before it actually gets to the full fanfare. And it's like I like it's almost like it teases it, and he does such a good job of of like knowing exactly when the I can't even pinpoint it. Can you? Yeah, because I I don't is when he's getting to the plane. Is that the first fanfare? I think it is. Yeah, yeah when he does the uh, like the Tarzan swing out into the water. I want to say that that is, but. I, I would agree too, and that's about fifteen minutes in. This movie flies by like a like a breeze. It's fantastic. And I believe this is the shortest of the Indiana Jones movies runtime. One fifty five uh, on this one. One fifty eight on Temple. Two oh seven on Last Crusade. And two two on Crystal, Crystal Skull. So you're right. But I mean, the movie is so incredibly paced. It really is. You know, it starts off with a bang. Yes. But then it slows it down in the scene uh, at the school, which I think is fantastic. And the uh, the love you written on the eyelids, it cracks me up every time. And it, the way he sort of stops talking yes. mid, uh, mid-sentence because he's trying to read what it says. It's, uh, you know, we get introduced to Indiana Jones and then we get introduced to sort of still referred to as Indiana, but we sort of get introduced to Henry Jones, the professor right two different sides to a coin but both the same kind of yeah. thing one's the rugged adventure and the other's the scholarly professor and it's almost within it's under 20 minutes i think and it's you have everything you need to know about the character so let's just get on to the adventure and honestly i think that's what this movie yeah. does so well is sets up all of its characters the minute you introduce them. I mean, when we see Bellic for the first time, you know exactly who he is as well. Yeah, and I think that that's uh, attributable to George Lucas uh, because in his plannings with Spielberg, he didn't want mm-hmm. the characters necessarily to be like watered down or, or too much necessarily like gray area. It's like he, he wanted a very solid type of character for each person and didn't mm-hmm. want to do anything that was unnecessary to that Which definitely totally is shown. In this as well, there's no fat in this movie anywhere. Yes. And I mean, I was already talking about that with pacing, but it really is true. There's nowhere in this movie I could say oh, that probably could have been cut and it would have benefited it. It's just start to finish is uh, everything is important and it's wonderful. What did you think about the fight that happens? I think in it's the a ball? great fight. I think it's probably my favorite fight there or sequence of the entire movie other than maybe the airplane fight at the end. But uh, I remember watching it for the first uh-huh. time. And, you know, I was I was used to Star Wars at that point or something. And, oh, this is by the same people that did Star Wars, really. Okay, I'll watch it. And I was watching it. And then there's one headshot. I don't, I think it's Indy shoots somebody in the head. And blood sprays out. And it's immediately, I was like, oh, this is something different, yes. isn't it? And I find that entire sequence is so it's it's mayhem, but it's so well orchestrated mayhem with fire everywhere. And I don't even know where the people are in the bar sometimes that are attacking Indy and Marion. And of course, the amulet getting dropped in the fire, um, the whole place burning to the ground. But the oh man, here we go, Garrett. Taut. That's what I'm going to call him. The joke here is uh, we don't know how to pronounce his name. That's fine. When he grabs the amulet and uh, he burns his hand, you know, on first glance, that's kind of like, yes. oh, he burned his hand. And I think that this movie, something it does really well is it sets up so much and pays off so much with that. And of course, coming in later on how they how mm-hmm. do they get the the amulet head if Indy has it. But also in the bar scene when she's drinking the guy under the table that comes in later when she's drinking Bellic under the table. It's all Chekhov's gun, but in good ways, I think. Oh yeah, no, de- definitely. It's a like 
actual like fantastic storytelling. And it's like there's so much stuff like that where it can balance the humor of both Indy and Marion, but then also have like the evil villainous of the Nazis and mm-hmm. like people getting punched and shot in the face and set on fire. It's you know, it's like it does the fight scenes aren't silly, but then, you know, you actually have really silly, funny things going on as well as character development, and it's just like you take them all as you're supposed to take them. It doesn't seem like there's a note. That's Absolutely. Like, oh. The tone is never muddled, I think. Despite it having a bunch of different tones. You know, whether it's right. going for the pulpy fun or the humor or the intense or even sometimes the scary, right? It's trying to spook you. I think it nails every single one of them mm-hmm. and transitions between every single one of them so seamlessly that one wouldn't even know that you know, it's switching almost to a horror for a little bit. Or now it's becoming more of a comedy when someone like Sala comes in. How about the um, iconic swordsman fight? That is so good. I mean, even not if the, if you don't know the story behind it is, um, well, they, they were filming in uh, Tenunzia, I guess. Is that how you say it? Uh, I assume so. Yeah. Something like that. And it's and because of the heat and obviously the conditions that were going around, they didn't have a huge budget. Um, it ballooned out of budget multiple times. Uh, and a lot of people got sick. It was like either dysentery or uh, food poisoning or heat stroke and all this other stuff. And Indiana Jones, Harrison Ford was actually really sick. And they had planned on this very intricate duel with the sword guy and he just couldn't do it and so after a few takes he's like hey listen george or steven or whoever what if i just uh shoot him with my gun and they're like that's a great idea so that's what it ends up being is the guy goes and does all the sword play and everything and harrison ford just shoots him and kind of shrugs <laughs> <laughs> and it's just so great because that is so in character 100 percent. i can't even imagine what the duel would be like right because it would be so not out of character, but it just wouldn't be that moment. Right. I mean, that's that's the Han Solo I know scene with Leia. Yeah. It's like I, I can't. That establishes the character so well. I can't imagine the film without. It. And that's another instance where Harrison Ford changed it because he was just supposed to right. say "I love you too." Right. But that's not Han Solo. Much like that, this wouldn't be Indiana Jones. Mm-hmm. It could right. be, but this would be much more of Indiana Jones than that. That moment of of when he shoots and shrugs is it gets like almost applause from me every time I watch the movie. It yeah. never gets old. And I almost find myself pulling the gun out with him, you know, right? making making the, making a finger gun and pulling him out and shooting him. It's fantastic. But I think that that's a that's a great moment within an, a, a great chase as well. I love that entire chase sequence. Mm hmm. The, the sort of chaos of Marion hiding in the in the barrel and then being or the basket and then being taken away. Right. But it, it cracks me up every time I hear the line uh, where, where they pick her up in the basket and she goes, you can't do this to me. I'm an American. <laughs> That's great. I don't know why it cracks me up, but it cracks me up every time. Well, and it's like, um, you know, there is that it's like almost comedic timing of every time he goes around and he goes around a corner and he looks, then you kind of see them going off in a different direction. So he has to run after him. And, you know, and it's like mm-hmm. there's the comedy thing of like the people going in the different doors. Like I think yeah. the Marx Brothers did it and, and Bugs Bunny did it. And it's it's set up and time to where it could be that. But it's just it's he knows how to have adventure and fun and still have that peril. But but not like give you anxiety watching it because it's so heavy. Yeah. It always feels perilous, but it never feels like overwhelming. Yeah. You're never hopeless. Right. You never think that it all is going to go wrong. You always have that ongoing feeling of Indy's going to save the day. And I think he does a really good job in showing Marion surviving the explosion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not having that be taken away. Obviously, we can see Indy go through the sort of grief stages of of losing her. But we, the audience, know that she's still out there. Well, I mean, the the interesting thing, too, is 
and this is a film almost of juxtapositions of showing mm-hmm. Indy like really feeling for her and drinking and, and missing her. And then when he finds her again, leaving her there to, to her captors yeah. because he wants to get the arc found. And it's like, I like having the, that he makes certain decisions based on a, a, a general thing. And he's not, it's like, he's selfish, but he's not completely selfish. Well, it's almost a, like when he sees her in the tent later on, it's almost like a, Oh my God, she's alive. It's like, Oh my God, you're alive and hugs her. Okay. I'm glad you're alive. I got work to do though. I'll be right back. And then he goes somewhere else. Right. All he like, and, and, uh, you know, trying to rescue her in that moment would obviously be very counterproductive to what he's trying to do. Right. And I'm sure she understands. (laughs) She doesn't, (laughs) but you know, that sort of leads to the, the finding of the arc in the well of souls scene, which I think is awesome. Why did there have to be snakes? Why did there have to be snakes? Sort of that uh, that reveal when he falls down on his face and sort of sits up and then the snake sits up with him uh-huh. and he makes the terrified face. Yeah, I mean, and he, they they put like glass in between the actors and the snakes. But I mean, that's a it's a really good old fashioned special effect. Mm-hmm. You know, today you would have CG snakes yeah. that would clearly weren't there and the actor (laughs) you know has to play off a guy with a tennis ball (laughs) and it's like you know this is the yes there's glass in between but a guy is playing against actual things that are there and reacting to what's going on and it's just acting if you will yes and i think there's something today that is lost in things not actually being on set yeah and i don't think we didn't even talk really about um sort of the supporting roles outside of India Marion. That's true. What do you think about Sala? Oh, I mean, uh, Gimli is great. <laughs> and my axe. I think he really is. He's the perfect, I don't even want to call him a sidekick. Right. But he's the perfect so- sort of supporting role, I find, for Indy, where immediately you feel their history between each other. Yes. Even though you didn't get to see it. And I think that's so well written and executed to have these two characters and feel such a deep and rich history between the two of them without having to go like, ah, Indy, remember that time we did so and so and this and this or to show yeah. a flashback to them when they were kids. Well, the thing, too, is a, he's not like Indy is a really smart character that does a lot of stuff. And so to put like a lesser actor or not as good of a character actor or not as good of a character next to him would make him overshadow him. Mm-hmm. But, but it's kind of like this almost seems like the Egyptian Indiana Jones that's helping him. And they're more like a partner than they are a subordinate and a, a superior. Yeah. So, so being able to find someone, like you said, that has that chemistry and you kind of even feel the same thing with the guy that's um at the college brody yeah yeah that that gives him the job or or lets him know that there's a job available to begin with sort of the handler kind of thing sending him off on the on on his quests for the museum and yeah you do feel that rich and rich and deep history that they've been working together for a very long time yeah so so this is somebody that fills a need that that indiana jones has that that he doesn't do this certain thing and so he needs someone to help him in this and that person fits that, and so they work together, rather than it being like, Indiana Jones is a superhero and can do anything, therefore why does he need these other people with him? And it never, Mm -hmm. in this movie, it never feels like that. I'm so glad that you brought up sort of Brody, because I was gonna, I forgot about him when we were getting caught up in all this conversation, but I think he really is my favorite supporting character in the entire trilogy. Yeah. And he's so well played by uh, Denholm Elliott, and it's, he just, Oh, it's it's that perfect sort of M esque character for Indiana mm-hmm. Jones to send him off on the world, but of course in in Last Crusade he kind of gets his moment in the sun as well. Yes, but it's uh, it's that it's just perfect. It's these perfect characters in this world. 
and everybody plays them well. And that's obviously a testament to Spielberg and his direction, but it's to each performer as well and, and, and fitting so perfectly in their roles. Yeah. And, and that's, that's classic old golden age Hollywood where mm. it's like you could have an ensemble cast and every single person could pull their own weight and there wasn't a weak link at all. And there isn't a weak link in this movie. No. Not a single one. I can't even go like, ah, oh, well, maybe. Like, I don't even think there's a weak link at all. No, I, in I would any agree aspect with you. of this movie, right. really. You know, every it's it's one of those movies where everything is there. You know, the writing is on point, the story's on point, the performers are at their highest possible capacity, and the direction is wonderful. The music, the cinematography, and everything. It's so many people that are experts at their craft coming together to make something greater than the sum of its parts. I think. Uh-huh. Yeah, it, it is a complete film, and it's like we were talking about before how it's basically like a greatest hits of all the uh, Republic mm-hmm. serials. So they they like took the best of everything and the stuff they loved as a child and brought it together onto to give it like a big budget thing. And sometimes that's the best that you can possibly do is right. take inspiration from what you love and what made you fall in love with film. Let's say, yeah, and bring it to life in a new way and in a new imagining. And and do the exact same thing for a whole new era of filmmakers. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, and people talk about remakes, and remakes of specific stories are, of course, I don't think, necessary or good. But I think there's a, there's a difference between a remake and sort of a reimagining or an inspiration. And I do think we need a lot more focus right. on something like that and bringing back these. Like, why don't we have an adventure film come out now that... that that oozes that Indiana Jones feel. I mean, we get it a little bit in gaming with Uncharted, uh-huh. but you know, there's not really that that adventure market is kind of untapped right now. And I've talked about it on the films from the basement and films from the Treehouse podcast. Every time we come across an adventure movie, how much I do love them, and it just saddens me to see how little of them really there are that are good or big or out there. So when something like Jumanji Two comes along, and it's actually decent and fun. You know, it gets it gets higher marks for me because it's it's hitting that adventure itch as well. Sure. I think one of your favorite moments in the movie is probably the airplane fight, right? I just the whole way. I mean, it's almost set up like a waltz. Mm -hmm. And it it reminds me a little bit of like how how difficult like it would be to like when Kubrick set up the centrifuge in 2001. Mm -hmm. It's like to have. To set up the players, if you have one guy on the front of the plane, one guy at the back of the plane, Indy has to fight them. Marion comes in and starts attacking the driver, who then hits the gear so that the plane is spinning. Yeah. So then the characters have to go around the spinning plane as well as the camera goes around. Plus, other things are happening, like the 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 tip of the wing clips the the gas canisters and it starts leaking gas. Mm -hmm. And so it's like you have, you have like a dance routine that you have to do. Plus like a ticking time bomb where, you know, it it, it keeps ratcheting up the tension because you know, something is going to happen. Then you have the, uh, there's always a bigger fish where the even bigger guy comes out, (laughs) takes the shirt off. That's great. How he just comes out and he's like, there's, I hear there's a fight and he takes the shirt off and he goes right into the fight kind of thing. Yeah, you know, it's it, it, Indy is giving them haymakers, and this guy is like hardly <laughs> knocked back. You know, it's it's ridiculous. And every time he punches Indy, Indy's flat on his ass in the dirt. That's the best. Is when Indy gets socked in the face. The first hit he takes, he gets punched square in the jaw, and he steps back for a second, and he falls right on his ass, and he's yeah. there's like a little bit of blood trailing underneath his lip. So it's like he he can't, you know, he's he's in over his head, and and all this stuff is happening, and how's you know. It's, it's a it's not the same kind of a fight as it was at the beginning of the film where you kind of feel like maybe they had they were they were a little loose but they had it under control whereas here and then and it's not only just that but then you have these Nazis from the hills that are running in towards them <laughs> mm-hmm. you know so it, you, you're not just concerned about is the plane gonna take off is, is something gonna explode from all the gasoline are the Nazis gonna get there how are they gonna get out of it you know, so it's just I, I love the way that this was filmed and documented and and how it turned out. There's so many moving parts that are executed yeah. so perfectly 
in tandem with each other. Yeah, if they would have done one really well, it, it would have been a fantastic set piece and you wouldn't have thought about it. But it's like they... It does like eight different things yes. perfectly. Yeah. And it just becomes that much more. So you, you almost... It, it almost works like clockwork. And if you're not paying attention to it, you like almost lose how difficult it had to have been to plan all that out. But it works. And there's that moment where, again, Chekhov's gun and setting up things. It's a little bit less, a little bit quicker of a moment, I suppose, or the time between the setup and the payoff. But when the first guy attacks uh, Indy with the wrench, they're wrestling with the wrench for a little bit, and the wrench gets spun into the blades Yes. and chips off. Now, if you just look at that, you can go, well, obviously, the, the rotors are spinning, and that would happen. But I, I think if that moment wasn't there, you almost wouldn't think about it. And I think, you know, that adds another element to it with the rotors coming around now, because you're thinking about the rotors. Are they going to hit it? And of course, you know, the bloody moment happens at the end where he does get hit by the, the propellers. And, and what a great scene to not really show anything, but your imagination understands everything that just happened. Yeah. And honestly, I think it's even better to show it with just imagination because then yes. you get to a, you can imagine the nitty gritty. It could just be one quick, clean cut, maybe, or it could be, you know, it could mulch him. <laughs> right. You don't know. So so at that point, it's like you're thinking about what happened to that guy rather than thinking, well, that looked like a fake body or that was too much, you know. Yeah, too much blood. Wow. Oh, well, that didn't look real. Yeah. You're not thinking about that at all. You're thinking, oh, my God, did you see what happened to that guy? Yeah, exactly. I think a really funny moment, and I don't know why I completely forgot about it until it happened, is when they're on the boat shortly after the plane, mm -hmm. and they're sort of like winding down in their room, and they're both checking themselves out on opposite sides of the mirror, and, you know, they're sort of both getting ready for, uh, you know, get down and dirty kind of thing, and uh, making sure they're they're good. But Marion kind of she pulls the mirror down and it whips Indy in the jaw <laughs> and it cuts out to the boat and you're ah, and then it cuts back in and it's just it cracks me up. But I totally forgot about it for some reason until we watched it again. It's hilarious. Yeah, I love that part. And it's... that's just my quick little insert. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, and it's like she's kind of concerned, but at the same time, she's kind of like, why was your face there? <laughs> 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 and obviously they get to the to the to the down and dirty in where they he has, where does he it has hurt? to kiss everything that hurts yeah yeah <laughs> it's such a it's there's so many great character moments in this movie that are elevated from stuff like that and i even though we feel sort of again going back to the history of these characters and we feel that history in their first scene together like oh, i Indiana Jones, when he when he when you see the when you see his shadow back at the bar scene, mm -hmm. all the way up to like I'm your goddamn partner. You can feel their history through there, and 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 but it it comes back again in full swing, sort of towards the end, in the best way in this character moment way of building that sort of suave kind of where does it hurt? It's a good scene. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, there are so many good scenes you, you could literally like just say every single one that happened. Oh, imagine that. It's almost like it's a perfect movie. <laughs> now, how about the ending sequence? And we'll skip over to uh, when Indy shows up at the top of the hill with the rocket. OK, I love that sort of standoff of him standing and threatening them all with the RPG. Yes, it's it's great visually as well as it tells you that how, what the stakes are now. Mm -hmm. but you totally know he's not going to do it right you totally that, are calling bluff and Bellick does as well yeah and so that's the nice thing about setting up the character beforehand mm -hmm. is that it doesn't come as a surprise like why didn't he do it it's like you know why he wouldn't do it and you know it's kind of like almost his last resort of, of trying to get him to stop he'd only do it if he absolutely has to which you know yeah again like you said testament to how they build the character throughout the movie Exactly. Or he can show up with the rocket at the end, and you're like, what? Why would he do that? And Bell yeah. calls him out, and then, of course, bluffing. Then it sort of leads to the power of God scene, 
which I always find interesting. And of course, the wonderful special effects. Uh huh. With the face melting and imploding and exploding. And it's absolutely fantastic every time I watch it. I almost want to rewind it and watch that entire little five second sequence over and over again with all three of our main villains dying. It's great. And uh, yeah, such satisfying deaths too. It's not yes. like, well, uh, he he just didn't make it. No, you saw what happened to this guy. Yeah, well, I love the stories of like, um, and it did win the visual effects Oscar as well. But sort of, you know, the whole the whole idea of building the wax figure and then putting the heat lamp underneath it to melt its face. Uh huh. Or I'm pretty sure they shoot something with a shotgun to blow Bellick's head up. And I think the other one was air that did, yeah. like pressurized. Yeah. Yeah, or like a balloon or something that they deflated. Yeah. It's so it's 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 just fantastic. Man. I feel like we're gushing about this movie way too much. <laughs> well, again, it just it shows how practical effects and there's something actually there. It's just I don't know. I, I love it so much more. It's so much better than if they were to do that nowadays with CGI. Yeah. It's so much better and it looks great like it doesn't even look fake it looks real with the exception maybe of tots like when you see the white part melt underneath but uh-huh. at that point you know it doesn't matter right because it's it's adding to that pulpy sort of serialized fun adventure feel right yeah and and i get you or maybe you read about how they made ethereal figures how they had like mannequins in a pool and they undercranked the uh the film Oh, yeah. So that kind of gave it that, that like weird uh, movement to it and everything. And then just, I guess, superimposed over top of the film. Yeah. Yeah. And that that seems fantastic, too. Or the uh, the light of God shooting through all of the Nazis. Uh huh. Very, very Ghostbusters. Yeah. 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 It's all just these great. This It's this fantastic final 10 minutes, you know? Yeah. It's it's a great way to to satisfyingly close out or to kill all the bad guys, but also to sort of introduce the fantastical sort of element that carries through a single film. Yeah, and it's like there's that what you could think maybe is a throwaway line at the beginning scene with the government about how he's like a uh, expert on the occult. Mm -hmm. But it kind of uh, just solidifies some of that of his character that future movies will delve into more well what is it with the um you know the power of god if you believe in that sort of stuff right and then you know it being true is something is that i find is very interesting to to outright say and then i know it's a different movie but i'm just curious and i don't and i want to know your because i'm fairly certain you dislike the movie (laughs) (laughs) at least more than i do (laughs) which is um I just don't understand the complaint about the alien in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Maybe from a story standpoint, I can kind of understand them, but I do see frequently people talking about how maybe unrealistic or kind of uh, jarring it is to have the aliens be real at the end of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull when all three movies set up this fantastic power of God element to them. Well, I would have to say that they could give hints as it being aliens because here there there's hints that like, this is what the Hebrews thought it was. But then like the Nazis are like, we think maybe it's some type of a communication device or, you know, just whoever has it is invincible. And it's like, it, it is generic enough to where you could be, okay, it's something supernatural, but it's not, it's not su- quite God. Right. right? God doesn't yeah. come down and introduce himself and start talking. to people. <laughs> Whereas in kingdom of the crystal skull, they, they give all this like, Oh, there is a crystal skull. Is it just, did somebody make that? Or is it an actual skull? What's going on? There's some weird stuff. But then they have a room full of actual aliens and an alien actually like, touching the mind of the lady and it's like mm-hmm. i think they revealed too much to where there was, was no ambiguity subtle and, yeah right okay. and so i i think that's the part that was like eh. also if someone says 
I believe in God, you don't automatically write that person off as crazy. You're like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> but if someone says, I believe in aliens, you're kind of like, why do you believe in aliens? You know, it's <laughs> it's like uh, the uh, ancient aliens guy with the really high hair. You automatically yeah. think that guy's crazy. You know, but if you, yeah. you know, if you saw like, pastor bob talking on the television you just say, okay yeah that's that guy you know Even so I, we all totally know aliens are real right they gotta be out there somewhere uh-huh that's trying to get across the border um <laughs> so you know i i just think that some of that is kooky people believing in aliens and they just showed too much and i think it was among all the other problems the film had, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. Okay. I can see that. I just wanted to have that little discussion. Right. But but I, I have no problem with it being aliens or supernatural or, or just some unknown, unexplainable power. If they would have just said UFOs and they didn't explain where or how it came, I would have been fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So do you not like Crystal Skull? No. Okay. I do. <laughs> that's fine that's fine but then again it's also a nostalgia factor right sure i was somewhat young i'll say when it came out well people can their taste is a thing and people can like different things and that's i mean fine. we I, did a podcast on films from the treehouse on wrath of the titans a film huh? that i stood by months and then we watched it for the podcast and i apologized because it was yeah. awful it was terrible so I haven't seen Crystal Skull in like six years. I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. But this yeah. isn't the Crystal Skull podcast. Not yet, but it might be one day. One day. You never one know. One day. How about the finale of this movie? Final, final moment. As the Ark gets put into a box and shipped off or, or put into a just massive warehouse. Yes. It has to be one of the greatest endings ever. I've... Is the fact that the government has who know and that's with that ambiguity again who knows what are in all of those marked boxes what else have they found what else is the government's i'll tell you what's secrets? in one of them a crystal yeah, skull, a crystal skull? <laughs> that's uh only later i mean i do like the fact that they said that that's area 51 mm -hmm. in kingdom of the crystal skull i thought oh yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah, you know, instead of just generic warehouse, but it's also Could not. Could you imagine it's a warehouse in the middle of fucking Texas? Yeah, I mean that could be interesting too. Um, but just just the fact of opening up so much possibility now, and it's like what's it, in it, all of those boxes? Yeah, if the it, ark has to be hid there, what else has to be hidden? And so it 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 like makes that universe suddenly become so real and so interesting. Mm hmm. Because there's now all this available fodder to, to do things and, and to say, yeah, the government's aware of all this stuff and no one will ever know about it. You know? And so any uh, you know, conspiracy theories are interesting, even if they are crazy. So it just opens up all that possibility of conspiracy. Now, what would you think of a Cloverfield-esque universe with a bunch of different period pieces and a bunch of different styles of films, but at the end of each one, the strange item or something that is plaguing the characters of that movie is shipped off to this warehouse and you just see it get added in. That's like might... a Twilight Zone esque thing, <laughs> yeah. except there's this there's there's this sort of connecting line through each one, which is that area fifty one. I mean, if all of that, if the ending for every single one is that, I think not only would it get old, but you'd be able to figure it out ahead of time. Yeah. Um, if that was, if you were making a TV series and that was the beginning. Is well, Garrett, have I got news for you? Uh oh. There's a TV show called Warehouse 13. Oh, that's right. On sci fi that almost deals with this exact thing, and that show's okay. Yeah. That, that's the thing. You'd have to, it has to be well done. <laughs> and you have to have budget <laughs> on it. I mean, but my dad the... tricked me into watching that show back in the day when it was first airing. By saying, "Hey, Alex, uh, it's uh, it's set in the Indiana Jones universe, same warehouse. You want to watch it?" And I went, "Yeah." It wasn't. Then you were like, "No, Dad, you tricked me." <laughs> yeah, but at that point, I was dug in too far, and I had to keep watching. Yeah, I, I monster of the week things don't really do anything for me. Nope, I I can't watch them anymore. Back then, I could, but yeah, 
it really is just a perfect way to end the film, is it not? Yeah, I mean, because lit- if there were no other Indiana Jones movies ever, it, it would it would contain everything you would need to know about the character and the world he lived in. And the movie's not called Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Right, it's literally just it's Raiders, Raiders, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. So it almost was intended to be just this one-off film. And if it was, it doesn't matter. It's self-contained in its entirety with hints of something more. Right. And I think the fact that they carry that is, is fine. But if you just watched Raiders, you would be totally fine as well. Well, and the next movie is a prequel. So they yeah, didn't exactly. even want to and Not many people on. know that, I find. Right. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Or it's interesting where all these stories, all fo- all four of them can be watched sort of standalone. Right. Just like the old serials. <laughs> now, how do you think this movie measures up against some of the other films that it came out at the same time as? Or how does it measure up to some of the more adventure films or action films we have today? Uh, well, I, to me, clearly, it's the greatest adventure film. Yeah. I, I can't think of anything that even touches it. I mean, the closest adventure films to it are the other films of the series. <laughs> I was going to say, the closest <laughs> one to it is probably Last Crusade. So, you know, I mean, uh, as I I like other adventure films. I mean, it's like even stuff that has practical stunts like The Phantom, which is a really cheesy movie. But like mm-hmm. because of the stuff in the time period, I like it. But it's kind of like this is the, the, the top of the mountain. Um, I, 1981 was an amazing year for film. Yeah. I mean, it, it's still my favorite film of 1981. Mm hmm. But, what else came uh, out in that? Evil Dead. Evil Dead came out. The Road, Road Warrior, Warrior. Escape from New York. Uh, das Boot, who actually one of the models of the submarine was taken from them shooting <laughs> that film. That's interesting. Um, Michael Mann's Thief. Oh, one of my favorite Bond movies for your eyes only. There you go. The original Clash of the Titans came out. Oh, interesting. Actually, I don't like for your eyes only. Never mind. Oh. I got it confused with The Spy Who Loved Me. You can't go and confuse all those films. Well, that's why I, I thought I would clarify immediately. <laughs> An American Werewolf in London. John Landis History, Landis History of the World One. Yep. Well, Mel Brooks is help, fantastic and hilarious. Mm-hmm. The Cannonball Run, Time Bandits. It was Stripes. just a really, really good year for film. Yeah. Uh, De Palma's Blowout. I would say Raiders is kind of the most timeless film of the year. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, you know, I I like a lot of the films that came out, but again, for me, Raiders is my favorite of them. And I don't I was and I asked how you think you could compare it to films these days, but I don't even think you can really. Yeah, because I don't make films like this anymore. No, not at all, which is why I'm calling. I'm saying it again. Let's go. Get your show on the road with some adventures over up in here. I mean, if you want to talk about, like, craftsmanship for the action and the pacing and where, like, no scene is wasted, I would say the closest cousin this film has in modern day would be Fury Road. Hmm. Well, maybe we'll just have to cover that on the digital soon. You never know. I totally agree with you, by the way. (laughs) I didn't even think (laughs) about that. Got any fun facts for me about Raiders of the Lost Ark? You film buff bitch <laughs> uh i mean uh there's the r2d2 c3po hieroglyphics on the wall yeah um i i i have seen this i don't know if it was intended to be this way but when uh indiana jones and marion are tied up to the pole and and they're not looking at them opening the ark Mm-hmm. the light on, on the pole that they're tied to looks an awful lot like R2's top to me. Does it? It does to me. Okay, I'll have to go back and rewatch that. But... Now, whether or not the, it just was a, a, like a happy accident or just happenstance, or I just, it looks like it to me, but if you compare it side by side, it doesn't look like it at all. I don't know, but it, from one of the earlier times that I saw it, I that's what I always thought. Mm-hmm. The punches that you hear, they actually took a pile of leather jackets and hit it with a baseball bat, and that's the punches. So it doesn't sound like the slabs of meat hitting each other like you do in the old kung fu movies. Yeah. 
It's just that they, they always hit really hard. And I like the way that, like, again, the sound design is great. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'll segue into something here with one with one's little fan fun factor I've got. Apparently, the Well of Souls sequence was filmed on the set of the Overlook Hotel from The Shining. Well, I mean, the same studio space. The... Ah, okay. I was going to say, you know, they just it's shot a... it in the Overlook. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's it's at Elm Street. Yeah, which yeah. is kind of cool. Because, Garrett? Yeah. Why don't you let the audience know what's going to be up next time? Digital driving. Well, I, I'm guessing because you you said it in conjunction with that that we'll be watching the show. It's a Return of the Jedi, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you could specifically say Empire Strikes Back because they were going to film the snow scenes adjacent to the studio, but they had to push it off because Kubrick was still filming The Shining. Mm. So that was it's a happening place, man. A lot of, yeah, a lot of been happening. No, no, no. But next time, for real, we'll be watching um, the original Clash of the Titans because that was brought up earlier. <laughs> Fine with me. I got it on Blu-ray. Not nah, for real, though. I'll, I'll be real now. But next time, we're going to be watching uh, little Looney Tunes back in action. With live tarantulas. Ooh. <laughs> we're going to make a video of you running away from a boulder. Oh, see, that's great. Do that. As long as I can let the boulder crush me. Sure. That ought to be fun. I mean, if it's styrofoam, it shouldn't be that bad. Right? It's only a ton of styrofoam. I don't see what the big deal is. This was nominated for Best Picture, by the way. Yeah, and it lost because it's a piece of shit. <laughs> it lost to Chariots of Fire, which I haven't seen, but can't be rare. Star. Nobody talks about Chariots of Fire. Chariots of Fire is fine, but to me, it's, it's not the greatest picture. But what, what do is I the know? The greatest picture. The greatest picture? I think it, the greatest picture <laughs> is that picture I took last week of the sunset. I Let's knew just you say the picture of my mom. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> oh, scorched. Got gotcha, you, mom. Take that, ma. <laughs> okay, the last one. To achieve the sound of thousands of snakes slithering, Ben Burt stuck his fingers into a cheese casserole. No. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's that's on yeah, that's IMDb. Fantastic. And he won a special achievement award for sound effects editing. He deserved. <laughs> he deserved it. Did you know that originally uh, George Lucas wrote the script about um, Indiana Smith? Yes. Yeah, yeah. He wrote the he wrote the story, or at least the the script, or at least the story in 1973, which is interesting. And, um. Spielberg wanted to do a James Bond movie. Yeah. But George Lucas said, I have something even better. And he did have something even better. Yeah. Crazy. Imagine that. Well, I think that'll about do it then. Yep. That'll about do it for you? That It will. Was it good for you? I, I <laughs> liked it. <laughs> okay, well then, we'll catch you all on the flippity floppity. Next time, We'll be hitting up a little bit of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. Isn't that right? Yes. Yeah, because we talked about it earlier, even though I made so many jokes. So uh, here in the digital drive-in, we're going to be taking excellent and a lot of uh, perfect movies to us. Ones that we love and the ones that we want to talk about a little bit more in depth than maybe we usually talk about on some other places. Uh, so we hope that <clears throat> you enjoyed the sort of first episode, if you made it all the way through. And we really do hope that you'll continue with us through this journey to excellent movies. Ba 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 ba. Ba ba ba. A ba ba ba. A ba bye. Craig, get out of here!